Hi, this is Elena with Black Sheep 303 Creative, and my project today is a somewhat detailed look at how I've created this scene and colored it and shaded it um, using Spectra Noir markers. So the video is kind of long, but if you want a little more detail on how I do this, hopefully this will be helpful. So I'm starting off with um, an A2 sized piece of Gina K Designs Artist Choice white cardstock and I am stamping stamps from the Newton's Nook Winston's Lake House stamp set in some Gina K amalgam ink which is both um, alcohol marker friendly as well as watercolor friendly so it's one ink that does it all and so I've stamped the house in the upper right and you can see I have drawn a lake shore with a pencil line sort of across the lower third and now I'm stamping Winston um, in the middle left and I want to point out that the stamps give you a cue kind of right off um, as to how to create a scene because the house is smaller than Winston and so you know if they were standing right next to each other that would be crazy like it would look like Winston was huge or the house was tiny so you know from the size of the stamps that the house is going to have to go into the background and look like it's further away from him because it's smaller. So that is a cue right off. And then the cattails and the lily pads are more like in scale with Winston so he can be closer to those elements and it will look okay. And then additionally I drew a horizon line where the house was and now I'm just adding in some pine trees that mimic the pine trees that are in the stamp with the house. Now those pine trees are luckily very simple shapes and fairly easy to just sketch in and I just made them different heights and widths to make a, an interesting tree line. And then I added some additional grass along the cattails because generally in my experience at lakes if you have cattails you have a lot of sort of grassy leafy things growing around them. And then I added a little bit of grass sticking up around the legs of the chair just to make that look like it's actually sitting on a surface. And then I lined it all with my Copic liner in 0.03, but these last two trees I've only gone over once, whereas everything else I've gone over twice. So I'm going to go over these last two trees again to thicken up the line a little bit. And that's important too because you want to mimic the line weight of the stamps that you've stamped. And so always start out with like a, a pen that's either the same line weight or a slightly lighter line weight. You can always make the line weight of your hand-drawn objects dark, uh, like thicker. You cannot make them thinner. So just keep that in mind when you're adding hand-drawn elements to a scene. And then coloring them, outlining them in black and then erasing all the pencil lines makes them look like they've been stamped as well. Um, so hopefully they all blend together and look like one cohesive scene. So you can't tell the difference between the hand-drawn elements and the stamped elements. And now I'm going to color everything a little bit differently with my Spectrum Noir alcohol markers. I'm going to color each element in just one color and each one will be a different color um, to show you how, show you the difference that shading makes. Um, sometimes I think people are intimidated by shading and if you just color things in one shade, you know, each element a different color, that can look good in certain scenarios, but with an, a scene like this, it's going to be, it's going to look kind of flat and kind of dull, as you see right now. So I have base coated everything in, in a color, the lightest color I was going to use on that element, and then I've grabbed my color chart. So this is available on the Spectrum Noir website. I will link to it in the video description. It is a color chart that you can color in with the color, with the marker colors you own. And I know Copic has one of these as well. And you could do a, I have a combination of regular Spectrum Noir markers and Illustrator markers. I put them all on one color chart just because I'm gonna use them all together and they coordinate really well. If I have the same color in Illustrator as well as um, uh, the regular markers, I put them off to the side like they're on the right. But you can see the colors are not always the same. So that's GG2. And the, the regular marker is a lot yellower than the Illustrator. Um, sometimes they coordinate really closely, sometimes not. Um, so that's why I like to have them both. So this is PP5 in the regular and then PP5 in the Illustrator on the, on the right. And you can see the Illustrator marker is a lot lighter. So seeing all the colors I have helps me 
look at all of them and sort of determine what are good colors to shade with based on the lightest color that I've used. So you generally want to go like one or two shades darker when you are shading an object than what you originally base coated it with. And like with these yellows, for example, the bottom one is CT4, the top one is CT1. So the colors are getting darker as the numbers are increasing. And that is generally the rule of thumb with Spectrum Noirs and Copics. If you stay in the same color family, as the numbers go up, the colors go down. Copics a little more complicated, but Spectrum Noir is fairly uh, easy to figure out. However, like look at these two. DG2 and DG3 are really far apart on the value scale. Like DG2 is way lighter than DG3. So it's gonna be pretty tough to shade with DG3 over an object you've colored with DG2 and make that look natural. It's going to look like the shadows are like crazy dark. So I might pick a different green and like from one of the other green families that I've got. Although with, with Spectrum Noirs and my green selection, it's not so easy. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do the tip to tip method and I will talk more in much more detail in a minute about that. And, but this is a great way to get your, uh, seemingly disparate colors to work together. So there you can see like everything looks, you know, it looks okay, but it's kind of flat, you know, it's kind of flat. Um, it's not super interesting looking and nothing's really drawing your attention. Maybe the chair a little bit cause it's so white. But I'm gonna start off with the bear and I base coated him in GB8 and he's gonna be a brown bear. So GB8's a very light golden brown. That's what GB stands for. So it, it seems a little weird. Like he's like he's more like Winnie the Pooh than he is like a brown bear. But I'm gonna shade him and I'm gonna use the tip to tip method to show you how we can change his color and make him look a lot more interesting. And Here's an example of where like, I didn't really have a great light brown to use on him as the starting color. So I went with the closest color I could sort of pick that would work as the like light, when, when the light's hitting him, that's going to be the lightest color or it's going to be very close. And I didn't want him to be too goldy. I wanted him to be more tan. So I'm going with the, the row that's next to the GBs, which is the TN colors. And you can see I'm going to go with TN7, which is right next to that GB8, but it's really dark. So we have that same value problem where if I just color the TN7 as shadows on top of the GB8, it's going to look crazy. And you're actually going to see me do that here in a second, but then I'm going to blend it. And I'm also thinking about lighting, like where is the light coming from in order to determine where the shadow is going to be? You can get into a lot of crazy, um, detailed theory over lighting and shadows and man, I mean, it, that's what a lot of great artists do really, really well. Um, I'm not going to get into that. I am generally going to go with light. The light is above and from the front slightly. So like as if the sun is coming from that angle down and hitting him. So it's like one o'clock in the afternoon or something. Um, I'm not going to get into any complex shadows for this scene. And I think if you're a beginner in terms of shading, that's what you should do. As you improve and get better with knowing how light hits objects and how to add shadows, you can start doing some much more fancy lighting effects like sunset or sunrise or, you know, firelight or those kinds of things. But in the beginning, I would not go into that too much. All right, so I've got my TN7 marker and I am going to just add shadow. So I added some shadow like where his arm meets his butt, sort of like his armpit is going to be darker than his the top of his shoulder if you think about where the sun's hitting it the edge of his arm where it meets the chair is going to be darker than the top of his arm because the sun's going to hit the top of his arm first. And then it's going to be darker where his arm meets the, meets the chair, the edge of his face, like the lower part of his face and around his muzzle is going to be darker than the top of his head or the top of his muzzle. Cause the sun's going to hit that part first. And then generally you can kind of go, Oh, and then here, like the bottoms of his, the heels of his feet, are going to be darker than his toes because again the sun's going to hit his toes first and then get lesser as it goes down on the object the inside of his arm along his body or where it hits the chair on the other side is also going to be darker than the top so you just have to use some common sense to think about 
how's the sun hitting this object? Like, it's, is it hitting the top first or the front first? And if it is, then you're gonna shade the lower part and the bot, like the sort of bottom edges. And then anywhere where like a, there's a plane change on an object, so like where his ears stick up from his head, there's gonna be some shadow where those two planes are changing just because of the nature of, I don't know, shadows. Now they might, be, might not be as dark as like the shadows on his armpit, but there is gonna be a shadow there. So that's kind of a good general rule of thumb. Okay, so you can see how crazy that TN7 just looks all just drawn on there. Well, now I'm starting to blend it with the tip to tip method. So what I'm doing is I'm taking the GB8 marker, which is the lighter marker, and I'm touching it to the tip of the TN7, and then I'm drawing with the GB8 marker. And the longer I draw with the GB8 marker without touching the TN7, the lighter the color is going to get. So if I want that an area to be darker, I'm gonna to touch the tip to the TN7 more often, kind of like I'm, I'm doing on the edges of his face, than I will on the lighter portion. So like on the top of his face, I'm gonna probably draw more with the GB8 marker and let that TN7 color wear off of that marker so it will look lighter. And I like doing this because it really gives you a lot of control over the shading um, you can easily make areas darker or lighter. And like here I'm going back in and I'm adding a little more TN7 because it's gotten a little bit too light on the edges. And then I will blend that again um, just a little bit. But you can already see how with that sort of middle shade that I've created with the tip to tip method, adding the TN7 directly on there doesn't look nearly as weird as it did before I did that. And then I darkened down his muzzle like even more with, I think that was the TN8 Illustrator. And again, I'm gonna do the exact same thing with his arm. So I am going to um, draw more with the GB8 marker on the top of his arm than I will on the sides. And his feet, I looked up on a photo of bears, like the pads on his feet are gonna be lighter than the rest of his feet. And I'll actually kind of fix those later with, um, more of the grays and, and the GBs. I won't get into the detail of his feet at this point. And I'm not gonna go into too much detail on everything. Um, I'm just trying to give you general tips. And if you are interested in like every color that I used on every object, I will list all of that out on my blog post um, so you can see the combinations that I used. But generally speaking, you wanna go like one to two shades darker on your marker um, for like the darkest sh shading from the base coat color. Hopefully that makes sense. So like we're here, um, the base coat on the grass is DG2 and now I've got DG3. And where the lake meets the ground, there's a plane change because the ground is sort of sloping down to the, to the lake and then the lake is gonna go straight out from the grass. So I have put the darkest shade, the DG3, right along the edge of the lake where the grass is meeting that, that lake plane change. And then I'm doing the tip to tip method with the DG2 to the DG3 in order to blend the darkest color into the lighter color to create that sort of subtle, almost curved effect along the edge of, of where the ground meets the lake. And then I dotted a little bit of the DG3 into the grass and I'll dot a little of the YG2 in there as well to add just a little bit of visual texture and interest. And then the lake, I'm doing the exact same thing. So I base coated the lake in TB3, and then I'm taking TB5, and I'm adding in the shadows. So, and now I'm gonna blend with the tip to tip method. So all those dark areas were TB5, where I just drew it right along um, like the edge of the shoreline, underneath the cattails and underneath the, the lily pads. If you think, cause again, common sense the plane change at the edge of the lake is gonna cross the shadow, and then the cattails are kind of bushy, and so the light is gonna hit them before it hits the water that's around them. So the water around them is gonna be darker, and that's how you know to add a shadow there. Same with the lily pads. The lily pads are floating on top of the lake, so you're gonna add shadow like around and underneath them because they're gonna be hit by the light before the water that's right under them is. So you can, that's just rules of thumb when you've got the light coming from like above into the front as to how to know where to add shadow. 
And then I'm just using the tip to tip method to blend these two together. Now I did wind up using a lot of colors on the lake. I find lakes a little bit tough um, because, and so here I'm adding some blue turquoise. I will add a little bit of green in there and I'm gonna blend quite a bit of it and leave a lot of texture with some lines. Um, because I don't want this, I do want it to look like it's got some reflections happening. It's, you know, got some depth to it. I don't want it to look like the ocean, which tends to be a lot more um, turquoisey blue than lakes are. So that's why I added some greens in. Um, so I will list out all the colors on my blog again that I used on the lake. And you can sort of see I've, I've done some like just um, drawing lines across it, um, darkening down some of the shadows like here with my BT9. Um, and then I do blend with my TB3, but it doesn't take all the lines out. And I like that about it. Now with my lily pad, I did leave a lighter section on that. So I, I used DG4 as the base coat and then I'm adding LV4 on top of that. My cattails, I started out with, they were base coated with LV4 and then I added JG6, which is a really dark green. And now I'm trying to do the tip to tip method to blend them, but it's not really working because they're pretty far apart. So I decided to go to DG3, which is a good sort of tone in between. And I'm going to darken a lot of it down because I really wanted to separate the cattails from the lighter grass behind it. They're usually darker. So I did. So the DG3 really brought the tone down nice and dark. And then that LV4 just adds a little bit of highlighting here and there to those. And I'm going to skip over like the chair and the house and all that because it's really a lot of the same method that I'm using, just different color families. And really quickly, I just want to show you, I'm darkening the trees down. The ones that I base coated in DG4, I'm, I'm darkening with JG6. So anywhere where it's behind another tree, I'm adding shadow and then I'm blending it out with the DG4. And then on those yellow green trees, I'm adding LV4 because I don't want them to be super um, yellow green. And I'm just like doing a textural like kind of pine needly look. And then I'm going to blend it out with YG4. And then that last tree that's like kind of behind Winston that I base coated in DG3, I just left plain. I didn't do anything to it because I thought in combination with the other two it colors, it looked pretty good. And now I'm adding a little pink to his ears and his cheeks. That's one of the only colors that will actually like force darker colors out of the way. So I could do that after I had already filled him in. I'm adding black glaze pen to his nose and his eyes. And then I'll add a little white glaze pen to his eyes again at, uh, to give him a little highlight in his eyeballs. I used ATG gun on that panel to stick it to the front of the A2 size card base. Uh, this is the greeting from the stamp set or one of the readings. And I stamped that onto um, some, uh, again, Gina K Designs Artist Choice cardstock. And I'm just, I die cut it out with an Elizabeth Craft and Stitch Circles die. And I'm popping it up with some foam tape for a little extra dimension on the lower right there. Really, I didn't want to add much to this because I thought like the scene was really at the start of the show. So I wanted to kind of just feature the coloring. I did add a little bit of clear spectrum warm sparkle marker to the cattails, the lily pad, and the light green trees and the shutters on the house, just for a little bit of sparkle. But overall, the coloring um, is the feature of this card. So I didn't feel like I needed much extra. And that is the completed project. And I was really happy with how it came out. I thought it was super cute. And hopefully I've been able to give you some tips on like how to pick colors to shade with, how to do the tip to tip method with your alcohol markers, just sort of some scale things to think about when you're combining stamps together and how to just really easily hand draw some shapes to um, finish off a scene when you may not have the stamps to complete the entire look. So try that out, give it a shot. I think it's much easier than you may think. And you can always practice, practice, it makes you a lot better in the end. So have fun with it. Thanks so much for watching. If you liked the video, please give me a thumbs up and leave me a comment. I love getting comments. And if you have not subscribed to my channel yet, why not? You need to do that as well. Uh, here are two more video coloring videos I've done in the past. And thanks so much. Have a great day.